And we bless you wherever you're watching from. We call you guys blessed. We're excited that you've joined us. And I'm here today with my very good friend and internationally known singer-songwriter, Brother Paul Wilbur is in the house. Let's do that. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you. Pastor, brother, bishop, elder, yes. friend. Thank you. It's, it's a delight to be with you. If I was living within 100 miles, I'd come here every week. It's Church Alive is worth the drive. Yeah. Isn't that true? Well, I'm, I'm here today uh, tasked with a wonderful opportunity to perhaps uncover um, some treasures. And there are, I keep hearing this, look again, look again. There are things that have been um, hidden. My, my good friend Jonathan Kahn has done now the, these last 10 years on something that he calls mysteries. And there are, a mystery is not something that can't be understood. It's just something that is revealed. It's, un, it's covered and then it's revealed at an appointed time. I really believe that the church of Jesus has come to an appointed time. Acts chapter 3, verse 21, Peter speaking to a Jewish audience and he says, he, meaning Jesus, Yeshua, he must remain in heaven until the time to restore all things. Say restore. restore. I believe this is the era, this is the time, the kairos that we are in. We are now at a time to restore. He's restoring Israel. You are playing a big part in that by providing cover and shelter, huh? Zechariah 9, one of my favorite passages. Return to your fortress. What is Israel's fortress? It's the name of the Lord. That's the right. name of the Lord is a strong right. tower of safety. We're grateful for the Iron Dome, right, and all that stuff, but the, there is no greater tower of safety than the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah. And, and the church has been tasked with uncovering that mystery for a nation that is still, after 2,000 years, an unreached people group. 15,000 Jewish believers in a nation of six and a half million. Well, look with me in verse 14, because he's already got it nailed on page one of our Bibles. In verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark. Now that word signs is the Hebrew word ot. And it means for the unveiling or the demonstrating of awe-inspiring events. Let the stars and the moons and all the rest be for unveiling or declaring or marking awe-inspiring events and for appointed times. That word signs, appointed times. Now let's go over to Leviticus chapter 23 with that in mind. And that word, appointed times, is the Hebrew word moedim. Moedim. These are sacred times. They are appointed times. They have been assigned their place in the linear uh, strategy of time on page one of the Bible. Okay, Can, are we good yeah. so far? Good. We're good? All right, look with me in Leviticus chapter 23. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed moedim. Lest we fall into the trap that I have heard so often that these are the feasts of the Jews. Old Testament Jews, New Testament Gentiles. Old Testament law, bad. New Testament grace, good. 
if that doesn't scratch your spirit the wrong way, I'm in the wrong church. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my, say my. my. Who's talking? God. Yeah, God. Um, I would even go so far as to say Jesus wrote this. He's the one who handed Moses the tablets. Well, these are my appointed feasts. Listen, it goes further. The appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. Verse 3. There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work wherever you live. It is a Sabbath of rest to the Lord, you lazy people, you. Oh, I added that part. (laughs) So, lest we misunderstand, I am not saying here today on Pentecost Sunday that if you work a job, that God hates you on Saturday. Are you saying, Paul, that this is something I have to do? No. I'm not going to say that you have to tithe. I'm not going to say that you have to pray. I'm not going to say that you have to go to heaven. That is all up to you. And in the first service, we showed you how to come into a covenant that will actually change the DNA of your bloodstream into a supernatural blood that speaks of eternal things rather than graves and hell and death, which is what we got when we were born because we were born into a fallen place. So Sabbath, Sabbath. In Matthew 12, in Mark 2, in Luke 6... Jesus uh, takes it on the chin because the religious company who says you have to do this and you have to do it our way or else you've broken something and you should be carted off to somewhere else. And every time Jesus is rebuked, he says to to the religious folks, look, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Actually, he's saying to religious ears that here, I created this. This is why in Nazareth, they tried to push him off a cliff. They say, you are saying you are equal to God. And then he goes on. He says, don't you know, you religious nutcase? This day was not made so that you can... You can litter it up with all kinds of regulations and rules and can'ts and can'ts so that you make it a burden for the people that are called to freedom. But I made this day for you. This day is a gift to you. In another place, God says, this is a sign between me and you. All of these, and in and, and our next session, we're going to get into all of the feasts and maybe for a few minutes their places in the world and in the timeline. We have discovered a treasure. And I simply want to say to you look again. Look again. In a world that is troubled, in a world that is. The most common malady I hear these days, Pastor Troy, is anxiety. People are full of anxiety. It's hurry here, it's hurry there. You've got your, I I left my digital device somewhere. You've got every two seconds. Did you know that people now are spending 40% of their waking time on a digital device, 40%. Something is really wrong. And they're being trained. They're being brainwashed. They're being fed by people with an agenda. An agenda. And if heaven has an agenda, heaven has a timeline. 
heaven has invested in this earth that started as a garden and it will finish as a garden when the chief gardener returns and takes control of that olive tree. And he has, he has invested in his family as a part of our cycle of life. He's invested in us times to work, times to play, times to worship, times to rest. And he's, he planted it in the stars. He told us on page one, I'm going to, these are appointed times. And he said, here, I'll even write it down for you. And as, as the thousands of years went along and we're still going, he said, okay, look, I'm going to send my son and he's going to demonstrate for you what I'm talking about. And we loved him so much for that, we nailed him to a tree. So when we say Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat simply means cease. It's not a big mystery. It, it just means cease. Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, and I created this for you. I didn't create you in order to serve a time or to serve an, an, a, a space. I made this because I made you. I know what you need. But if you're just going to ignore these places of safety and shelter and peace and rest and go about your own business, what did he say in the Sermon on the Mount? He said in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he said, if you teach these things and you actually do them, don't be a hypocrite, don't say this is what we should do and then don't do it. He said, I'll call you greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If you don't do these things and you don't teach them, did he say, I'm going to cast you in hell? No. He said, you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And you may just drag your tired bones there on the last <laughs> breath you've got. He's invested in his family. Times, appointed times for us to work and to rest and to worship and to enjoy. Well, welcome back, everybody. Hey, how about that? <laughs> welcome back, my friends. I bless you and call you blessed in Jesus' name. I'm here with my good friend, Brother Paul Wilbur, and uh, we're talking about Shabbat Shalom. We're talking about, we're talking about entering into rest if we believe in keeping the Ten Commandments. Uh oh I know. We don't actually believe in keeping the Ten Commandments. One of them is this one. And so I want to tell you that just as uh, I, there's an argument if I'm a sixth or seventh generation Texan, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but I'm at least a sixth. I might be a seventh generation Texan, and I am a 16th generation American. Oh. So our people have been here for a long, long, long time. I come from a long line of frontiers people, which has always been separate from the rest of society. Always out not doing what everybody else was doing, right? Can any of y'all believe that? Like, wow. That's a shocker. And with that said, there's been a lot of things that we've lost. A lot of things that should be precious to us that are not been precious to us and have not been a part of my culture. Keeping Shabbat or the Sabbath has never been a part of my, of, of my culture, either as a Texan or even as an expression of worship or devotion or consecration as a, as a Christian. And the reason why I started is because when I started going to Israel, and I couldn't, my favorite night to be anytime in Israel is always on Shabbat, always on Friday night. Because everybody gets together and they do the Shabbat and they cease and they're like, dude, Shabbat Shalom. Everybody's saying Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. And yeah, and I, I it's just a big deal. It literally means cease and, cease and peace. It's like, okay, let's get out of the rat race long enough for us to just get together as family. And this is God's idea for us. And so I came back not knowing how to officially do it, but knowing that it was something I wanted to give my children and my grandchildren. I actually regretted that I didn't, had, that I didn't have some form of Shabbat Shalom for my kids. And I was like, I want to introduce that for my grandkids. And so 
we started going, okay, Friday nights doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to our family and it belongs to the Lord. Mm. And we put the, we put the beacon out and say, any of my kids and any of my, and anybody wants to bring their grandkids over, bring your spouse over, come hang out with us. We're going to have a meal. We actually will light a candle. I don't even know why we do that. You're about to teach us. Uh, we'll light a candle and we'll let one of the kids light the uh, candle. Uh, I'm sure that our food is not what everybody eats all over the world because there's always some form of chicken fried steak and gravy that is in our Shabbat Shalom. That's very important to me and Jesus. And, and it's fun also, too, to hear my hillbilly grandchildren say, Shabbat Shalom, Papa. I'm like, Shabbat Shalom, you little hillbilly. So... Since we have done that, there has been a greater unity in our entire family because we started serving the Lord like that. There has been a, a greater peace, not only among us as family, but just an intentionality towards peace, believing that there's a break coming. It's, it's literally changed the whole dynamics of our family for us to institute this. Mm. So tell us what it is and tell us how to do it. There are a couple of things that we do. Now, Sabbath, you can list with commandments, but there are a lot of traditions around that that, are, um, that we utilize. And in every Jewish home, this is the way it's done. There are candles, and I'll light those in just a minute, and, and there are traditional blessings that are spoken of them. In my home, I have my great, great, great-grandmother's candlesticks that go way back to the, to the former Soviet Union, and we, we use those in our homes. Tradition. It's just, there's something about it, right? And so there is also wine and there's bread. Now, today we have two loaves of special bread. This is, this is bread of the Sabbath. It looks good. Yeah. My daughter-in-law bakes this from scratch. Not these, but we had it uh, out at the retreat. Oh, man. Yikes. But you might you'll notice that it is braided, and it has three strands that are woven together. Why three? I don't know. Take a good guess. <laughs> now, today is Pentecost Sunday. And so, according to the scriptures, according to the, the, uh, the directions for this appointed time, we have two loaves. And on Passover, there's no leaven, right? The unleavened bread, which represents the body of Jesus, because he was sinless, is sinless, not was. He was, is, and forever will be right. sinless, right? So today, on this special Sabbath, we are instructed to bake two loaves of leavened bread. These can't represent God because he's without sin. Guess who these represent? Jew, Gentile. We, we are sinful folks. And so he said on this day when the marriage contract, oh, we've got to get into that in our next session, that we call Pentecost, when when Moses came down off that mountain with the marriage contract, and they are pressed together to reveal 3,500 years ago that the kingdom is made up of Jews and Gentiles, not just Jews, Jews and Gentiles, because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so today, we celebrate the fact that the kingdom is made up of really good-smelling Jews and really delicious-smelling Gentiles. And we wave them before the Lord, and there's blessings for them. That's today, the special Pentecost. So today, we have these, these special loaves, but they traditionally, on Shabbat, we have one loaf, it's woven together, and it reminds us that we're supposed to fold our arms across our chest and cease. Today is the day to cease 
for peace. And that's what this special bread is all about. Now we have 30 seconds to show you again these um, on our app. You can, you can see this over and over and over again. And we light candles. Why do we light candles? Because there are certain things that are used to sanctify or to set apart as holy. Now, God calls the Sabbath holy. What else does he call holy? He calls himself holy. He calls his people holy. He says, you will be for me a holy nation, a royal priesthood. He's talking about all y'all. So there are a lot of things that we use to sanctify things in the scriptures. You can sanctify something with oil. You sanctify something with water, right? Baptism or mikvah. You sanctify things with words. You also sanctify things with wine. You sanctify things with fire. They're set apart, made holy. And holy simply means other. So today on Shabbat, we light these candles, we speak blessings over them, and we set it apart as holy, separate unto the Lord and ourselves as well with the other elements. And there are blessings, and there's lots of different blessings. We take a traditional blessing and we, mm, uh, we modify it for us that, so that we say that we bless you, Lord our God, King of the universe, you have sanctified us. You've set us apart with your word. And you have given us Yeshua, who is our Messiah, the light of the world. And you've called us to be a light to the world as well. And that's how we begin. Then my wife will pray and she'll invite the president. She would also light the, the lights. And then she will pray and invite the presence of God. And I guarantee you, if you're at my house during these times, the atmosphere shifts. It shifts. It's just because our king is hearing something that is familiar to him. He's hearing a call to come and sit with us at our table where his face is revealed. So then we take the cup and we say this. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, king of the universe who brings forth the fruit of the vine. And in a traditional Jewish home, that's it. And this represents joy. And you can find that in Isaiah 58, which I don't have time to read to you right now. And then they'll move on to the bread. But in our home, we recognize that there is only joy in the life of our king. He's the one, this represents his blood of the new covenant. And so every Friday night in our home, we lift up this cup and we give thanks for the blood of Jesus who has made us holy. And then we partake of the cup and we move on to the bread and we give God thanks for the bread, which in a traditional home means provision and it, and it brings life and it's food. And we thank God that he's a good provider. In our home, we give God thanks for the body of Jesus who was given for us and in exchange for our death, we have his life. We remember, Jesus said, every time you do this, remember me. And so we do. Sometimes we're not even home, Pastor Troy, and we have done this at Cracker Barrel. And you would be amazed when the sun goes down. We, we had like 10 or 12 people out for dinner. We couldn't get home in time. We said, um, ma'am, do you have any votive candles? We, and, uh, well, yeah, not sure you can light them in the restaurant. Put them on our table. And then we asked for some crackers and some grape juice. And she brought them all over, and she just stood there, and she said, what are you, what are you all doing? And so we, we lit the candles. We did the blessings. We thanked God for, for the body and the blood Jesus brought us coming looked up and this waitress is standing there and her face is leaking. And she said, can I join you? Is it, is it okay? Can I? I said, sure. Yeah. 
it's a way of demonstrating God's faithfulness, right? And so she sat down with us to eat in the restaurant where she was serving our table. And then the hostess came over and she's crying. And she said, I've heard about this. Can I join you? Sure, do you know Jesus? Because this is what this is all about. It is amazing what happens when you take every opportunity that God has given to us to not only declare the kingdom, but to demonstrate it and share your table with others. Introduce them to the reason why we sit at Shabbat.